Hello and welcome to this presentation, which represents an interim, some of the interim findings from a three-year project funded by the Levy Hume Trust and undertaken uh, in partnership by representatives uh, who are named on this slide from the Edgehill University, Monash University, the University of Ghana, University for Development Studies in Ghana and University of Dar es Salaam. The research project has now been underway for two years and examines the issue of sustainability in African sport for development. At the outset of our research collaboration, we recognised that sustainability was uh, a key issue for sport for development, both recognised in policy documents and by a number of organisations. However, we identified that sustainability had been under-researched and was not always conceptualised by academics and those working in sport for development particularly clearly. Our research aims there were to, therefore were to explore how people uh, perceive sustainability, their approaches towards uh, achieving sustainability, some what factors affected the sustainability of, of sport for development programmes and to gather some data and indications perhaps on the extent to which sustainability had been achieved by either organisations or with programmes in sport for development. Data collection is an ongoing process in this project but so far we've collected mainly qualitative data um, both from a range of organisations working in sport for development both in Ghana and in Tanzania and just over 20 interviews across those two countries with representatives of organisations and also representatives of international donors uh, contributing to sport for development in those two countries and beyond. The other aspect of the research which has involved primarily junior researchers in three African universities has been undertaking data collection with those involved in delivering sport for development activities or the potential young people who might benefit from these activities in a range of school and community case study sites both in Ghana and Tanzania. As I said at the outset, this presentation comes uh, approximately two-thirds the way through of the research project and as such there remains further data collection to do and analysis of all the data. However, we felt that this would be a useful point in which to disseminate some of the emerging issues from the research project to date. Throughout the research and all of the data collected, we have recognised some dominant approaches to trying to address sustainability in sport for development and also some limitations perhaps with those dominant, dominant approaches which will raise in, perhaps in the form of questions. I would suggest that the, this dominant approach is based on sustaining sport for development programmes and the resources required for those uh, sport for development programmes. And in, primarily we've identified that organisations are trying to do this in two different ways. One way is sustaining the financial resources in which, through which programmes could be continued. Another way which I'll come to is trying to develop human capacity and resources who might then subsequently continue programmes. But first, in terms of financial sustainability, this was widely recognised across a number of interviewees as, unsurprisingly, a significant, ongoing, but to a certain extent unresolved challenge. I think from our data we can raise a number of questions uh, about this approach to sustainability and these questions perhaps depend on the perspective uh, that you would take on sport for development. In one sense, there was a common perspective that responsibility for financial sustainability should be passed on to the organisations in uh, the African countries after periods of, of uh, funding from international donors. And in one sense, that could be suggested as, as too great a burden to pass over to uh, 
the African side of sport for development projects. On the other hand, some organisations continued their support, uh, or international organisations continued their support for African uh, sport for development programmes on an ongoing and perhaps even time uh, unlimited time basis. One of the critical perspectives on, on that form of support would be whether it encourages dependence on behalf of the African organisations and programmes on international funding. From the perspective of some in-country organisations, there was perhaps and there was perhaps some feeling that they accepted the impermanence of sport for development programmes, and this was perhaps mainly amongst more larger or governmental organisations who realised that programmes would run for three or four years and perhaps wouldn't be sustained at the end of it. In country, other smaller organisations were more dependent for their own future as organisations on gaining further funding and as a result were prepared to, to change or adapt their programming or even their aims according to the funding that was available, creating perhaps the problem of, of mission drift. So I think these questions identify that there is no easy solution to the issue of financial sustainability, and each comes with its own pro program problems. There were some ideas, perhaps some more novel ideas, presented for, for generating further funds perhaps from private sector or individual kind of donations. But I think the broader question remains that the funding for sport for development in countries such as Ghana and Tanzania is very fragile, impermanent, and even these new ideas for generating funding maybe do not uh, represent a lasting solution to this problem. The second common approach or dominant approach as I've termed it that we identified towards achieving sustainability was to build up local capacity to continue to develop programs. This was often undertaken through a, a cascade model of training and human capacity uh, development and inherent in a cascade model is the idea that the expertise flows down potentially from the international donors who support programs to the kind of local level in country, in countries such as Ghana and Tanzania. And we can critique a model such as that as whether it, if we are cascading down, whether it fully uh, incorporates the kind of local knowledge that is important and value, already valuable and already held by some of the individuals who are being trained. Perhaps an even bigger issue is that commonly the continued delivery of programmes depends on the vol uh, voluntary input, often, of those people who have been trained. These are commonly young people who maybe live in very uh, changing circumstances and have other priorities within their lives and perhaps struggle to give an ongoing commitment uh, to the continued delivery of programmes and if not um, the, the subsequent challenges for kind of sustaining programmes. We might also question the extent to which training on issues regard to sport are sufficient alone. Whether it's young people who are trained who maybe need further training to enable them to generate a livelihood out of the work that they're involved with, or further training for the organisations in which they're involved to try and manage their organisation and manage their, their workforce to allow them to sustain their, their involvement. A common issue identified across our data um, in respect of issues that would be important to address in order to generate sustainability was a need to persuade various stakeholders, particularly in country, regarding the value, particularly, of sport for development. And we can divide those stakeholders that needed to be persuaded into those who are above and those who are below. Above represented 
policy makers and those making fund decisions in country, in Ghana and Tanzania. And some of the questions here are who can influence these policy makers to adopt a more positive or supportive ethos towards sport for development programs. International donors expressed concern about whether they were in the right place to, to make that case to these policy makers. Of the in-country organisations, many were too small or didn't have sufficient connections to even have contact with influential policy makers who could make a difference to the sustainability of sport for development programmes. There was commonly a belief that what was required to convince policy makers and funders was greater or better evidence of the impact of sport for development programmes. And this is an ongoing issue for debate in the sport for development field more generally. Perhaps though, we saw a few examples of groups of sport for development organisations coming together to work together to both work to develop this evidence and also to use their, their collective uh, weight to try and beneficially influence the, the uh, stakeholders and policy makers uh, that may make a difference. However, our evidence suggests that even then, the support, wider support for sport for development in country at that kind of level is still very fragile and dependent on individuals in their posts at, at that level, individual connections with those people, and other factors such as, for example, the change of government or ele through elections might overnight kind of destroy or undermine some of the, the progress that had been made in terms of generating a more supportive environment for, for sport for development. At the other level of communities themselves where sport for development programmes were being undertaken, there was a recognised need of the importance to sustainability of convincing local community stakeholders of the value of sport for development and the programmes that were being implemented. Those in individuals who became involved in sport for development programmes at that level indicated they had been convinced by what they had seen and what they had been involved in with regard to sport for development programmes and the impact especially that it had on young people. However, amongst wider important stakeholders such as local uh, community leaders especially head teachers of schools, it was all commonly reported that these types of people remained uh, to be convinced of the value of sport uh, to their organisations or their communities. And that was a key drawback to ensuring that those types of individuals played a role in trying to sustain the sport for development programmes that were running. From the perspective of sport for development programmes, we did not identify a huge amount of strategically led effort to try and convince these stakeholders. We could characterise the efforts as more of an ad hoc uh, approach to hoping that these stakeholders would see the benefits perhaps that young people gain from their involvement in the prog programmes and those benefits would ripple out to other key stakeholders such as the teachers, community leaders and even parents that I mentioned previously. If I've covered already some of the kind of main approaches and perhaps some of the issues with achieving sustainability in those ways, we come now to what our data suggests is a relatively neglected aspect of sustainability and particularly the, the sustainability of those outcomes for young people that they generate through involvement in, in programmes. In a sense, the sustainability of the development through sport. And I think that there's two aspects to this. There's the sustainability of young people's involvement in sport and the sustainability of the benefits that young people derive through sport. And I'll cover each of those in turn. With regard to 
involvement in sport, we find often that sport for development programmes are targeted at particular groups of young people and potentially particular age groups of young people, for example either primary school age or secondary school age. With this targeting, what we find tends not to be covered is a consideration of where those young people could continue to take part in sport once maybe they leave that target group or once they grow beyond in age, the target age group. And so perhaps we could suggest that these young people might struggle to sustain their own involvement in sport um, as they go through. In terms of the benefits that the young people involved in programmes derive through sport, those outcomes such as kind of personal and social, connected with personal and social development. One of our findings from the data that we have thus far is that those young people who tend to have the deepest involvement with programmes are most likely to benefit in, in some of those ways. So for example, young leaders who are trained and then continue to both participate and deliver activities tend to gain more than those young people who may just be involved in programmes as participants, although this is obviously something of a generalisation. However, our data also suggests a strongly about how belief that these kinds of benefits delivered through ongoing engagement in sports for development programmes are potentially useful in other contexts and transferable to those other contexts. And so to draw some conclusions about our data here, it would suggest that the benefits through sport are more likely to be sustainable if there is a quality of involvement of young people. And this maybe contrasts with the issue of sustaining participation in which perhaps a greater aspiration is a desire for quantity in terms of the number of young people who sustain their involvement in sport. And this is perhaps an ongoing tension recognised in sport generally, but one that may affect sport for development programmes in particular. As we come to the end of the presentation, I don't want to offer any firm conclusions given that the research is ongoing and the data analysis is ongoing and this represents uh, an identification of some interim issues. However, I will pose some concluding thoughts or questions that may be of interest uh, for those watching this video to consider and think about. A first question regards the programmatic nature of sport for development, with programmes being implemented over, tend to be implemented over time limited periods and perhaps uh, in isolation on their, on their own by particular organisations. And we could suggest that this focus on programmes and sustaining the delivery of these programmes limits our consideration uh, of sustainability in certain ways as I've suggested at the outset of this presentation. What the alternative might be perhaps remains open to question, but perhaps a consideration of more systematic and wide-ranging wide approaches to sustainability might be a possibility. And that relates to a question about the types of organisations we work with in sport for development or, work through, or working in sport for development. Do we want to deliver sport for development through already sustainable kind of organisations but focusing solely and perhaps in isolation on those sustainable organisations? Or does that ignore some kind of organisations that are newly emergent and pre uh, preventing uh, or suggesting new approaches? Or is there room for a more kind of systematic approach to uh, uh, developing sport for development in particular locations and areas and would that potentially uh, offer a more long-term solution. A final question 
is regarding the sustainable li sustainability line, which connects to the points that I made earlier. I think there is a common theme across our data that sustainability is considered in a linear way of the continuation of what has previously happened in exactly the, the same form. In one sense we could consider that line being set too high. Is it reasonable to assume that exactly what has been delivered before can be sustained? But in other sense, and I think perhaps even more importantly, is not to see sustainability as a linear aspect. Some of our data indicates um, unintended outcomes and unintended sustainable outcomes. So rather than seeing it as a, a, a linear process, seeing it as a process in which a wide variety of sustainable outcomes from kind of sport for development initiatives could be generated rather than solely continuing the delivery of existing programmes.